The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good morning and welcome to the Lumen Memorial Lecture. My name is Emile Giovanni Zuno. I am this year's student government president. Thank you. Thank you. I have the distinct pleasure to introduce you to a man. He is a father, an educator, and a relentless advocate for equity and justice for his students. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Fernando Delgado. Thank you, Emil. I, I, I feel the comment about relentlessness and support for students means that our next meeting with Student Government Association, I'm gonna to have to say yes to something. <laughs> Last time they wanted to talk about parking. Good morning and welcome to the Lehman Lecture. We gather what would have been Herbert H. Lehman's 144th birthday. I'm delighted to say that we are joined today by several members of the Lehman family, Wendy Lehman Lash and William Lash, for what is, yeah. And by the way, independent of the legacy of Herbert H. Lehman, these two members of the family have been firm and deeply committed supporters of of the college and what we do for a long period of time. So independent of their relationship to Herbert, they deserve a round of applause for how much they've supported us. So we're gathered today for what is not only a birthday celebration, but also a time for us to reflect on Herbert Lehman's legacy of civic engagement. Established in 1970, the annual Herbert H. Lehman Lecture honors the life and legacy of the college's namesake who committed his life to public service and social justice. The lecture has served as a powerful forum to advocate on behalf of more just, equitable, and inclusive societies. During four terms as New York governor and two terms as a senator, Herbert Lehman advanced reforms meant to end social inequality by working to protect union membership, establish unemployment insurance, and expand housing options for the poor. Herbert H. Lehman was also the first Director General of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. In that role, he supervised the largest international relief effort of its time, the shipment of more than 25 million tons of supplies to refugees of World War II. By the way, my father got to fly on some of those cargo planes. I just found that out last week for my brother. Um, as I shared with the Honorable Freddy, Fernando Ferrer, excuse me, Fernando Ferrer, CUNY trustee and former Bronx Borough president, when I invited him to deliver today's lecture, I see in his remarkable career a similar vision and passion for public service and leadership. From his 14-year tenure as former Bronx Borough President from 1987 to 2001, to his time on the New York City Council and beyond, I view his trajectory as directly connected to what Herbert H. Lehman symbolizes to our campus, as well as our activism and engagement. He was even quoted saying so in the New York Times back in 2013. I quote, look, if in your DNA there's a couple of public service genes, they don't go away. Public service was always very satisfying. And as a member of our trustee, he continues to give. So believe me when I say it is an honor to turn it over to the Honorable Fernando Ferrer for his lecture, Lehman's Legacy, Public Service for the Public Good. Thank you, President Delgado. That was a 
an extraordinarily generous introduction. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the invitation to be here this morning to deliver this talk. I'm reluctant to call it a lecture uh, because there are people in this audience who don't need to be lectured about public service, um, who know it very, very well. So good morning to all, President Delgado, President Emeritus Fernandez, um, and student government President Zunon. Uh, very good presentation you made. Better keep an eye on you. And good friends, all of you. Thanks, President Delgado, again, for inviting me to give these remarks on public service for the public good. Lehman College is very special to me. Some of you already know that I am wed to a proud Lehman alumna, Dr. Aramina Vega Ferrer. There's always a doctor in my house. My closeness with Lehman has only grown from the first moment I set foot on this spectacular campus over 50 years ago. Getting to know in the course of my public life so many students and faculty, members of the staff whom we treasure as good friends. As many here know, I've been a public servant for a long time, and the public good has always been important to me. But lately, the public good seems under siege. Economic and technological power is increasingly concentrated in fewer and more unaccountable hands. Too many leaders pander to narrow interests and information seems just as polarized as our politics. Without those faithful to a common public interest, we risk being, as the late scientist Carl Sagan once said, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true. So there's no better time than now to remember powerful examples of service in the public interest. From international leaders standing against tyranny to men and women of science facing down a global pandemic, to chefs marshalling their art to feed the hungry and the displaced, to nurses who labor under crushing loads to care for the sick, and teachers who are inspired every day and in turn inspire those who teach. All of them continue to answer that special call to service. In 1964, Jacqueline Kennedy said her late husband, President Kennedy, believed so strongly that one's aim should not just be the most comfortable life possible, but that we should all do something to right the wrongs we see and not just complain about them. One person can make a difference and everyone should try. That simple thought, one person can make a difference and everyone should try, powerfully framed the optimism of the time and continues to remind us that public service was and remains the important vehicle for making a positive difference in the lives of our neighbors. That opened my own eyes so many years ago to the possibilities of a life of service. In an earlier generation, Herbert H. Lehman also saw the possibilities of a life dedicated to service. Lehman's fidelity to the common good and his legacy of public service offers another lens through which to see some of today's challenges. As much a product of his time as his namesake college, both Senator Lehman and Lehman College draw heavily from the idea that service in the public interest is still the best way to make a positive difference in people's lives. In Senator Lehman's case, he was informed and inspired by his service as Lieutenant Governor in then Governor Franklin Roosevelt's administration. Later, he succeeded Roosevelt as governor and launched his own Little New Deal, enacting important minimum wage legislation benefiting women and children reduction in working hours for working mothers, and improvements in funding for public housing. 
after service as the United Nations' first chief of its re rehabilitation effort in war-torn Europe in the wake of World War II, Lehman was elected as United States Senator from New York and distinguished himself as the conscience of the Senate and one of the bulwarks against McCarthyism. His untimely death on the way to Washington, D.C. prevented his receiving the very first Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Kennedy in 1963. The citation accompanying the medal he was to receive read, Citizen and Statesman, he has used wisdom and compassion as the tools of government and has made politics the highest form of public service. Fewer than two decades later, in the wake of the post-war economic boom, population changes, crises in the Bronx, and the audacious community-ignited rebuilding, Lehman College graduates continue to make their own contributions to the borough and to the city and the nation. For many in this theater, you are like me and the Lehman alumna I married, the very first in your families to graduate from college. We didn't come from privileged homes like Lehman or Kennedy did. Our families had to struggle just to keep up with the bills. Nothing was easy, but still we persevered. I learned early in my life the special power of possibility. On the Sunday just before the election of 1960, my family did as we always did, all the cousins gathered at our grandmother's first floor apartment on Tinton Avenue for after church breakfast. Once the meal was done, my father and I looked out a window facing the street. As people passed by, they would ask my father who he was voting for. Kennedy, he answered. Someone else passed and asked my father the same question. For Kennedy was the answer. Then I asked my father why we were voting for Kennedy. He said, because he cares about people like us. I think I understood what that meant then, and I certainly understand what it means now. And that was the day a 10-year-old kid from the South Bronx began to get a glimpse of what might lay ahead. I hope that I put forward another way of looking at the world and ourselves, I am and have been all my life, it seems, a public servant. My own journey in a life of service led to working for the city and the state of New York, being elected to represent this community in the city council and later as borough president of the Bronx, nominee for the Democratic Party for mayor of New York, the first Latino ever to have had that honor, longtime vice chairman and three-time acting chairman of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and now a trustee of City University of New York. As a member of the city council, I'm proud of legislation I passed, like the window guards law, which dramatically increased penalties for building owners who failed to install and maintain life-saving window guards in apartments with small children and the hospital interpreters law, which required interpreters in hospital emergency rooms where patients could not understand to communicate with doctors because they couldn't speak English. And after the embers of the burned out neighborhoods cooled, I'm proud of the part I got to play alongside so many committed neighbors and leaders in rebuilding the borough I was born raised and educated. I know our own journeys and your own learning and this very special place inspire you in similar ways. So it's important that we recognize that none of us got here alone. People who had faith in us and people who had never even met us before stepped up to help make these opportunities for us. Now, our commitment must be to pay it forward, to empower yet another generation of strivers to be inspired, to learn, to dream, and to make a difference. That's the debt you owe, and that's the debt after all of these years I still joyfully repay. 
Make government at all levels work better for the next generation of New Yorkers. Serve our communities with pride, humanity, and a faithful commitment to social justice. Lehman College is, in that sense, the embodiment of Senator Lehman's public service and leadership. Lehman's student body is drawn largely from Bronx working class and first generation migrant and immigrant families. This college has been and continues to be a brewing ground for those who already know how to make a difference. And fittingly, Senator Lehman's expansive and inclusive political outlook is amply reflected in successive waves, teachers, political leaders, nurses, business leaders, and lawyers who proudly call Lehman College alma mater, as, the, as does the Lehman alum I married. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Eileen Markey, Professor of Journalism and Media Studies at Lehman College, joins Trustee Ferrer in conversation. Well, Mr. Borough President, that was lovely. Thank you. It's a lovely, wonderful talk. Thank you. I'm struck by the phrases in your closing paragraph, um, a proving ground for an expansive and inclusive political outlook. Um, that could be a definition of the Bronx particularly in the decade and a half when you were at the helm, um, when, when the borough was rebuilt. Can you talk a little bit about how a commitment to public service, both on the part of elected leadership and on the part of those grassroots neighborhood groups, rebuilt the borough? I think it was only that um, inspired look at life. Why are we doing this? We're doing this for ourselves, for our children, for our neighbors, public service that would help people persevere through those very tough times. Some of you might remember, I certainly do, like it was yesterday. The smoke from the fires. Those were tough times for our borough. Tough times for my family and for many families who are in this room. But we came through that came through that because people cared, people stepped up, people made sacrifices in their own lives to make life better for everybody else. I reported an article just a few months ago um, that was a look back at, at housing issues and a look back at the wealth creating ability of some of those, um, those small home ownership programs. Um, in talking to people who lived in those, in those buildings, really as I began that interviewing, a uh, woman who'd been one of the first homeowners, right, Karen Washington, a great Bronxite, said, you know, I said, how did this happen? What, what was the history of getting these houses? And now you're moving on. And she said, thank God for Freddie Ferrer, that he made these buildings actually get built off, you know, they'd been on the agenda for a long time, but to get them occupied. So you think about the, the long longevity of those sorts of interventions. Um, today, the borough faces almost an opposite crisis, right? A crisis of speculation that's driving the homeless crisis. Um, and it's pressing more than one in three Bronxites to pay more than half of their income in rent. More than one in three Bronxites pay half of their income towards rent. Um, it's utterly unsustainable and it's making some people very rich. How do we protect the homes where Bronx families are trying to build their lives? I think trying to clarify the condition would help. Mm -hmm. So for example, a tragic uh, Twin Parks fire in the Bronx. It is horrible. People perished. Um, reminded me that that development is today 50 years old. When I was borough president, it was 20 years old. Relative to new housing. It's a sobering reminder that nothing is going to last forever without maintenance, without regulation, without people staying on top of the major systems. 
no doubt in my mind, and I'm not an expert in this, but no doubt in my mind that, oh, thank you. No doubt in my mind that one of the, uh, that one of the uh, problems with that fire was there wasn't enough heat in the building. That's a problem of regulation. It's government's job to make sure people provide heat and hot water. And no two ways about it. Um, but by the way, while we're talking about the failure to provide heat and hot water, let's not let the New York City Housing Authority off the hook. For years, it has been the worst landlord on planet Earth. The worst. And that's public housing. So yeah, we, we have to begin to look at what our expectations are of public and privately owned and publicly assisted housing. We have to regulate it all. Look, if somebody's going to make a profit to build housing, God bless America. But at the end of the day, People need to be held accountable for, for providing decent housing. And accountability is what government's job in this context is all about. Um, and frankly, we haven't been doing, government at all levels haven't been doing a good job. When you understand that um, something, I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience I have living on Fox Street. Well, we didn't have uh, heat. You would hear the radiators clang. Uh, people would bang the radiators for heat. Sound familiar to some people? It was a symphony by the time everybody got involved and uh, caught up in it. But it was a reminder that Nobody was providing heat. And people should not be expected to live that way. People should, especially in New York City, should not be expected to, to be able to raise a family without heat and hot water, leaky apartments. Those are the predicates of being able to have a stable family life. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that we need to do. Somebody wants to get rich, God bless. Do your job. Your job is to provide decent and affordable housing. And if you don't do that, you should be out of the business. Changing tact a little bit or changing direction a little bit. Um, you spoke about how our information is as polarized as our politics. Um, and as a journalism professor, it's an issue close to my heart. Um, indeed, one feeds the other, this polarized information system and our polarized and extreme politics. Um, our ec ecosystem of information is on its face diffuse, right? Anybody with a Wi-Fi connection can be a broadcaster, like printing press in everybody's pocket. Um, the old gatekeepers are completely toppled, right? We talk about horizontality. Um, but the distribu distribution methods are held in far fewer hands than ever before. Um, it's, it's three companies, right? It's Google, Meta, and Apple that control how we, how we interact with how we receive information. Um, and they're unaccountable. Um, manipulation is manipulation that rewards extremism is built into the DNA of these distribution platforms. That's not a glitch. That's the point. Um, so for all their many faults, Hearst and Pulitzer, right, and they have many faults, we're never this shameless. Um, how do we bring a commitment to public service into these systems that deliver the information on which our democracy depends? If I had the answer, um, anyway. I don't. However, I have some ideas about it. I'm a consumer of the news like everybody else. I have an allergy to Fox News and that channel. 
So um, the only time I will land on it is probably by mistake. That said, we can all, we can all benefit from knowing what everybody's thinking and how everybody's expressing themselves. And yeah, you read um, the daily news and you get one world view. You read the New York Post, you think you live on a different planet. I mean, did this really happen? I just read about it. Yeah, anyway. And then the Times, you know, tries to be in the middle. This person said, that person said, if by the middle of the story, you don't care. We've got to find a way to express this and to do this work, important work, a lot better. I'm not sure that there's an answer to the polarization of information, but I do know that too many people want to feel good about their, their information instead of want to understand what's really going on. And that's dangerous. So if there's any lesson in all this, it's step out of our comfort zones and find out to the best uh, that we can what really is going on. Um, here's an interesting example. If you read some of the uh, accounts of uh, Will Smith's um, um, adventures at the Oscars, Fewer than 24 hours after that occurred, everybody's got a strong opinion, including me. Everybody's got a strong opinion. And I long for the days when people say, let's see how this develops. I don't know, you know, I'm not sure about all this. I don't understand what the history is here. Um, you know, yeah, some jokes aren't funny, you know, and if you're a husband or, or boyfriend, yeah, you'll take that personally. But you want to take a minute to step back and consider everything else. It just takes a minute. And that's the minute we're not taking anymore. That's the minute we're not taking anymore, right. Um, when we think about the role of media in, in maintaining or in communicating democracy, you know, you've had this long career in public service. You've dealt with all kinds of reporters, TV reporters, print people. Um, and we're often really pushy and we're often really annoying. Um, and we're certainly difficult for elected officials who are you know, working to promote um, what they believe is right and what they're working towards. And then the reporters come in with these other uh, you know, twists uh, or you know, not part of the party line, right? That's our, that's our point is that we're not part of the party. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you managed that? Um, thinking, especially when you were a borough president, when you were on the council, we had a much more robust local news cohort, right? The Daily News in that time had 200 people on staff. It has about eight now. Um, you're right. The New York Times actually had a Bronx borough, right? A Bronx bureau to cover the borough. Uh, right now, the Metro desk there says we cover New York City in a way that could be interesting to readers in Dubai. That's what the Metro <laughs> editor told me. Um, so it's a really different ecosystem. And then that's not thinking about the shrinking news hole, um, you know, in other publications and on TV and radio, even though they exist and over, even though they've proliferated. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you interacted with media and how you continue to um, and, and sort of how you manage that? In some way, we're both working towards the public good. I think most reporters or many reporters think of ourselves as um, we became engaged in journalism because we care about the public good, but obviously that looks different than an elected official. Well, I've come to accept that not everybody mm -hmm. in, in your profession is interested in the public good. Most of them work at the New York Post. Yes. Um, <laughs> see, I don't really care about the ramifications <laughs> anymore. Um, and yeah, I've, I've seen reports and seen reporters uh, who have um, inspired me to, 
to think like Will Smith from time to time. None of that solves anything, makes you feel good right in the moment, but none of it really accomplishes anything. And look, if you're in this profession, public service, you better toughen up. Um, you'll get some slings and arrows from time to time. So will your family members. Um, those are the parts that are most annoying, but Look, you got to understand that comes with the territory. Looking back, I'm glad I kept my temper mostly in check. Um, and I think for the most part, the story gets out. It always does. I mean, every my mother used to tell me everything comes out in the wash. That is true. Uh, and you learn that every day of your life. Everything eventually comes out in the wash. The truth, not the truth, people figure it out. Um, may take a minute, but people figure it out. Yeah, thank you. You've made a few references both in your talk and in some of your answers to the, the difference between what feels good and what's true. Um, what's the role of public higher education in equipping students to be able to discern the difference between what feels good and what's true? And maybe how did you learn this and how should we be teaching it? One of the highlights of my um, undergraduate years at NYU when I used to live in a good neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, on University Avenue mm -hmm. um, is having been carried out of a building uh, over a demonstration concerning the war in Cambodia. Um, and some of my best friends in the police department, they're all retired now, but uh, I met when I was horizontal and they were vertical. Um, good people, um, you know, fortunately nothing uh, terrible happened. Uh, President of NYU uh, was very mindful of, uh, of, of trying to take the buildings without hurting students. And you come to understand that there's different ways of looking at life. Um, and the biggest lesson you can get from higher education is that. There are different ways of looking at it. That's what it is all about. When I became a trustee, we had um, a number of incidents with respect to safe spaces for students and uh, freedom of speech, which is a perennial issue uh, for public and private higher education. And someone asked me when I visited, actually, Bronx Community College, met with students, um, they asked me, well, what do you think about it? Now, look. My own view, my part of my worldview is, say whatever you want, just as long as you don't endanger anybody or threaten anybody's health or safety. Mm -hmm. Those are my dividing lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had those dividing lines in, uh, on the board of CUNY, on the MTA board, and other places. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody or threaten to hurt anybody, hey, it's America. People need to express themselves. The extent to which they feel they can't or won't um, is something we lose. We lose in, uh, in our public life and in our private lives. And then you begin to think, well, who's going to object to this? And why would they do that? And you know, they'll ruin my life. Well, we have those worries. We have to really re-examine our our basic assumptions about expression. Right. Thank you. Um, today is Herbert Lehman's 144th birthday, as we've said, which is a perfect day for this lovely conversation and this lovely lecture. Are you um, having a birthday cake? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Medal of Freedom that he was awarded mentioned his wisdom and compassion. Um, I don't think we often think of compassion as a public virtue. Um, as, a, as a virtue in public, public life. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about compassion and the role that it's played in your work and in your life? I came to understand very early in my public life, very early in my private life, that every problem has a human face. Well, that's easy to say. Well, that sounds good. Let's write that down. But it does have a human face. When you talk about building services in an apartment building, the human faces are kids who, you know, go to bed with coats on. What is that? This is New York. Why is that still happening? Um, human faces when some senior citizen cannot get somebody on the other line to fix their problem in their public housing. What is that? Why are we putting up with that? Um, so all of these things have human faces to them. That's not compassion, that's understanding you're a human being. You live on the same planet with other human beings. You have obligations to them. And if you have a sense of decency, it's an obligation to yourself as well. Yeah, an obligation to yourself if you have human decency. Can you say a little bit more about that? A lot of things I could say. Um, over the course of uh, my time as borough president, and I'm especially glad that uh, that the 13th borough president uh, is here, uh, borough president Diaz, um, a great friend for a long time in whatever office he held, uh, but he's seen similar things as I have. In that job, you will see bad stuff. You will see people shot dead by total strangers. You will see people perish in a fire. My own tough time was seeing early the victims of Happy Land fire on Southern Boulevard. I, I, I wish I could forget those images. It would be nice, um, but they're tough. The obligation is to, to remember, wait a minute, if there's something we can do about this, Let's do it. Um, I remember after Happy Land, we all uh, worked ourselves up and uh, social club task force and inspect buildings. And, and that's all useful and good because so far as I know, nobody can see into the future and know when one of these things will happen. So while some people dismiss it as closing the barn door, uh, once the horse is fled, um, I think it's, uh, it's at least being responsive. But there are other things we, we can and should be thinking about. Uh, can't predict every calamity that will befall us. Wish we could. Um, wish we could prevent a fire or two. That would be nice. Wish we could prevent a traffic fatality that prematurely takes the life or health of, of someone, that's, it's wrong. Um, and to the extent that we look, when Mayor de Blasio um, put in place the um, 25 mile an hour speed limit, mm -hmm. my wife and I were cheering. I mean, everybody should cheer. Um, drive slower. Where are you going? Are you driving an ambulance? Um, drive slower so you don't run anybody down. Stop at every intersection. How long is it going to take? Um, so yeah, there are things we can do and, uh, and should be doing. Yeah, these are these fairly practical and specific interventions. When you were on the city council, you pushed for window guards, for hospital interpreters, and we can look back 
a few generations and think about countless lives that were solved, that were saved by both of those really specific and concrete interventions. We need window guards on apartment buildings. We need people who speak every language in the hospital or access to people who speak every language. Um, thinking about the Twin Parks fire and one of the policy interventions that came out of that, right, is, is self-closing doors and stricter inspections and punishments for lack of self-closing doors. How do we use government to address those concrete and specific problems? Okay, we need window guards, we need hospital interpreters, we need self-closing door inspections. How do we use government to, to make those concrete, you know, concrete issues be used? But also keep a focus on the big picture issues, on the big picture um, about how we build the structure of a good society. Bigger ideas. Well, we have to be able to do both things at once, um, or else look for something else to to be involved in. Don't do government because you got to walk and chew gum at the same time. When you um, when uh, the uh, window guards legislation was interesting because window guards were always required. But the penalties for not having them and maintaining them were so low that people could not maintain them or not install them with impunity. So first, we had to examine where the law sat. That law sat not in the administrative code, but in the health code. I don't bet you nobody knew that. Um, and in the health code, who bothers reading the health code? It's like nobody reads the fire code. Um, and hardly anybody understands the administrative code anyway. So the first step was take it out of the health code, put it in the administrative code. Second step was have clear expectations about what we wanted to accomplish. Third step, increase penalties dramatically to make it completely untenable for a building owner not to install or maintain these things. Once we started to do that and drew attention to it, it's amazing how, people, how young people stopped falling out of windows. And that was very satisfying um, to know that um, I could speak at a commencement at Lehman College and look into the faces of students whose lives may have been saved by window guards. Who knows? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I was thinking about what, what you were saying about, um, really, I think what you're talking towards is integrity in some of your answers. Um, and so thinking about lessons learned in, in a long career um, and the, the role of public service and the role of doing things sometimes that are unpopular. Um, I, was a, I was just a couple of years out of college in 2001 when you were the nominee for mayor. Um, and I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking about is some of your answers, right? You're thinking about process. Is this in the health code or is this in the administrative code? Knowing, knowing sort of how government works on a functional level, one of which is having elections and keeping elections. Right, and so at a moment um, of, of crisis for the city um, and a tremendous amount of jingoism, you took this really important stand and said, actually, we have elections in this country. Uh, we don't postpone elections when we're frightened. We don't postpone elections when we're a little, when, you know, when, when we faced tragedy. Can you talk about that decision and looking back on that decision um, 20 years later? And maybe to give the young people in the audience um, the primary, the election was on September 11th, 2001. And, and so obviously the election was held off that day. We, we stopped the polls, obviously. And then there was this drive by then Mayor Rudy Giuliani who said, we're in crisis, I should get to stay on as mayor. Uh, we'll postpone this election. I'm in charge, let me stay. Um, and a lot of people in city government said, you're right, this is a terrifying moment. We don't know what's gonna come next. Let's postpone it. And um, Ferrer said, uh, no, we have elections. Yeah. 
A friend and ally and contributor of mine warned me that that would cost me the election. <laughs> and he was probably right. And 20 years later, I still don't care. Um, because that may have been the first glimpse that we all saw of, of authoritarian Rudy. I knew it was always there. So when I had people coming to me, very powerful and important people saying, look, we should give him the time he wants, it's okay. Um, you know, he can have, uh, he, you know, he could overturn term limits if he wants. So what are you talking about? How are you gonna let that happen? You know, um, look, I had the same objection with Bloomberg. Um, did it in a less gross way, but it was gross nonetheless. You don't postpone elections for any reason. We didn't do it in the middle of the Civil War, for God's sakes. We didn't do it during World War II. We didn't do it in the Korean War. Why are we thinking about postponing elections now? In fact, having an election is the biggest act of defiance and show of strength to the people who tried to snuff it out on September 11th. Now, I remember that day um, better than a lot of people. For a moment, we stood proud. City was united, country was united. We did what we needed to do. But make no mistake, people were still afraid. Remember sitting in a group of people and hearing a plane come over. Now, it's, now it happens all the time. You live in the flight path in the Bronx or anywhere else. That's what it is. At that time, we were all looking up and wondering whether we should jump under a table. Those are scary times, but they shouldn't scare people from doing the right thing. And the right thing is always democracy. The right thing is always um, having elections and letting people um, do what they're going to do. Um, look, I've been on the receiving end of good election news and bad election news. The good election news takes care of itself. Look, the bad election news you gotta be prepared for. You win or you lose. You can't look at these things as opportunities to change history, to change your outcome. Uh, that's just, that's wrong and immoral. I, I know it's not, um, it's not vogue for even retired politicians to talk about morality, but my civic creed is the Constitution. Um, those are the things that I believe in. He said democracy is always... Maybe I should run again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's like a narcotic. <laughs> you said democracy is always the right thing. You know, my students, that's the quote you pulled. Democracy is always the right thing. Um, our students are hustling. They've been told by society and by popular media that they should climb, that they should climb and get their lucre. What was it that inspired you to take on that Kennedy call um, that life isn't about attaining the most comfortable position, but that it's about righting the wrongs that we see? Well, the road was made easier for me because my family didn't have that comfortable position anyway. <laughs> um, however, Kennedy was the most inspiring president of my lifetime. And there have been great presidents before and since. But Kennedy was the most inspiring. The one who spoke to your heart and emotions and said, look, there's something big we all need to do. You understood that instinctively. And it inspired uh, a view of life 
in me and so many others um, that still stays with me. Um, you have an opportunity to, to make things better. Look, uh, on the MTA board and on the city university board, you know, it's hardly, um, you know, working in the Elysian fields. It, it's, it's a big deal, though, mm -hmm. to students at Lehman who need us to keep control on costs so that they can afford to go through college without massive debt. They look to us to do that. The faculty looks to us to ensure that there is fairness in their treatment. Um, everybody looks to us in this community to make sure the buildings are in good repair. Uh, the, you know, something as, as mundane as bathrooms working. Uh, that's important to some people, but it's important to trustees too. So those are the things that, uh, anyway. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We have some questions from students and, and other members of the audience oh, very cool. um, that are handed to me on index cards. Um, so, and they're all really on a theme. Um, what advice would you give to students who, who care about public service and want to participate in something, but maybe it's not going to be what they make a career of? Doesn't mean you have to. I did, uh, and other people did. But the advice I would give to anybody who is interested in this as, a, as something to do right now in a way of life is, OK, get involved with something. Don't be a spectator. Don't sit on the sidelines and handicap political races. Get involved in one or two. Uh, and if you have an extra two bucks or five bucks, Give it to the candidate you really believe in. Those little contributions make a difference. The work, the contribution of your work and effort and the time you put into it make a large difference. That's the way to, to change things. When, you know, this is like anything else in economics or in life. Politicians know how to do a great many things. One of them is they know how to count. Trust me, they do. They know how to count the number of people who are working in their campaigns. They know how to count um, who's contributing and how they're contributing. But they also know how to count, OK, who's going to vote for me? How many people are inclined to vote for me? How many people are not? What do I need to do to reach them? And that's where students can make an enormous difference by letting people know, wait a minute, these are the things that if you're going to be you know, elected to office that you need to be concerned with. Um, thankfully, most of the people who, are, who run locally have enormous experience with uh, our public university system from friends of mine uh, uh, who were the borough president or the uh, member, member of assembly, state and city uh, university, uh, and so many others, including me and my wife. Um, you know, we know what it takes, but not everybody does. So that's what you got to remind them about. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, yeah, so thank you very much for being with us and for this wonderful and wide-ranging conversation. It's good to be with you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's fun. I used to look younger. <laughs> Thank you all.